Good morning. Good to see everybody. What Kathy said is so true. I hope that when you sing the Christmas hymns, you see the full gospel. Because how many of you know I've been trying to teach people, you got to see the full gospel. It's not just that he came. It's not just that he died. It's not just that he rose. It's not just that he ascended. The full gospel is what? He's coming back, right? He's coming back to fix everything. And so that's one of the things I love about Christmas is, you know, when you read the Bible, I've, I've shared this with you guys before, but the chances that Jesus was able to fulfill just 48 of the prophecies about him are so minuscule that he could do that without being God, that it would be similar to you randomly selecting one electron out of all the known electrons in the entire universe. Now, I know you haven't had science in a while, but how many of you know there's a lot of electrons floating around out there, right? And the fact that he could fulfill just 48 of those prophecies, which he already has, are that minuscule, right? But he did it because he is God. But why that should bolster our faith is he didn't just fulfill 48. He's already fulfilled more than 300 of the prophecies about himself. Now, as a mathematics person, I used to teach high school math. I can tell you one of the biggest reasons that I believe that the Bible is God's holy word is fulfilled prophecy because it defies all the laws of mathematics and science. But if he did fulfill 300, I don't have any doubt that he's coming back. Amen? And that's what I think Christmas, what we should focus on is the purpose that he came. He didn't just come to be in a manger so we can sing about him being in a manger. He came to die to make everything right again one day. You guys excited about that this morning? Okay, got to get you excited. I feel a little bit of a need to ramp up the excitement, okay? I'm going to have to get emoji sticks myself and show them to myself. We're starting to get inquiries come in about the baptism event, and I'm thankful for that. This is open to men, women, teenagers, and children who are able to understand and want to be baptized. If you are interested, and you can come from anywhere, I mean, we had people from all over the country for this, you have to let Hope and Passion Ministries know because you will need to attend a, an online baptism class with me that I'll teach. I want to make sure you understand what it is you're doing, and uh, then we can be in touch back and forth about this event. But if you feel the urge to be baptized now that you know Jesus and you want to make a full obedient stand for him publicly, please reach out to us and let us know. We've also been, been selling quite a few of these, haven't we, Bria? We've been having to rustle up the boxes and package books, and that's a good thing. We need to clear out some of the older books so that we can publish some new ones. So, I mean, this is a good deal. These books are each at least 220 pages long. They're packed. I write the way that I teach, which is take a scripture, take a passage, break it down in a way everybody can understand it. These are daily devotional books. They're only $10, and that includes shipping. So if you're looking for a meaningful Christmas gift for people or a stocking stuffer, good solid devotional is a good gift. So you can get in touch with us on that. Uh, don't forget you can give on Venmo, and there's the hub of where you can go for any of these things. You're interested in baptism. You're interested in purchasing the books that are on clearance. You want to become a recurring monthly partner. You want to give us an end-of-year gift. That's where you go, hopeandpassion.org, or you can write to us in Irwin, and we are grateful for every single person that is a part. Okay. The book of Daniel. Let's go back there. And we're going to close out Daniel chapter 1 this morning. Daniel chapter 1. Everybody's still okay bouncing back and forth between Romans and Daniel? I actually like it. It's kind of neat. You know, because you get all settled and think, oh, I'm learning Daniel now. I'm okay with that. Then you got to bounce back to Romans, and it makes your brain go another direction, right? Good balance of books. Okay, so Daniel chapter 1. We're in verse 17, and we're going to read through verse 21. 
Before I read the narrative, let's refresh our memory. It's always good to go back to context, remember where we left off. So, you know, Daniel chapter 1, if you take your finger to the beginning of the chapter, what God did in the first part was remind us of what is happening to Daniel and his friends and why it's happening. Daniel and his friends had been part of those young people who were taken captive by who? Very good. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, they're captive there. This had been prophesied that it would happen. Why were the Israelites taken captive by the Babylonians? Because of their what? Because of their disobedience, direct disobedience to God's word, uh, their idolatry. They became captive to the land of Babylon. And I hope some of you, when you're reading the Bible now, are starting to see the connections. We can make a direct connection between them and us. Because we, let's just talk about America today. We in America today have really been taken captive by a godless culture. Hasn't the church been taken captive by a godless culture? And you say, why? Because the culture is so bad? No, because the church is so disobedient, right? Christians have not walked with God as they should. We've lost our impact and we've become captive. And so this is very relevant for us today. So we see these four young men. This is who's focused on in the book of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to put them through a training program because he wants to knock the Jewishness out of them and shove the Babylonian culture into them. Hmm, that seems like something the public schools are doing doesn't it? Although I was thrilled and delighted to attend Taya's Christmas concert at her public school this past week, thrilled that more than 50% of the songs that were sung of the 20 songs were thoroughly and completely Christian carols and hymns. And I'm taking it upon myself to write to the choir directors and thank them. I don't even know if they, they did that on purpose or they knew it, but I'm telling you, we need to keep having impact in our world, right? Because it's like a retraining program is what the world is trying to do to us and our young people, not just through school, but through television, through commercials, through everything. Walking through the mall, it's like they're trying to reprogram your brain. Okay, next section. We learned about Daniel's faithfulness in the midst of this. He could have been tempted to eat the king's delicacies and all of his good food, but instead, what did Daniel say? I will not disobey the Old Testament law that I am under. I want to eat vegetables. Can you imagine? How many of you want a child that says, Mom, I just, I feel convicted. I just want vegetables, right? Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, but anyway, I just want vegetables. And, and, and the head of the eunuchs was like, uh, you're crazy. Like, that's not going to work. And Daniel said, test me, try me for 10 days. And did it work out? It worked out. So now we're in another phase of this. Now, that was about the food. That was about Daniel and his friends taking a stand. But as we get to verse 17, we're going to learn about how God blessed these young men for staying faithful to him in captivity. Any of you in this place are online learning how much God can bless you when you really start to get serious with him and stay faithful in a godless culture? Can you feel his blessing? It's amazing, right? So look at verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them, check this out, 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of the kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year 
of King Cyrus. Daniel was there the whole time Babylon was the world power. Isn't that crazy? And they were 10 times more insightful and had more impact than all of the secular culture around them. Who is a Christian would like to have more impact? More impact than the godless culture. That's what we're aiming for. That's what I'm excited about, hope and passion. And it's reached to uh, an older generation, a middle generation, and a younger generation. Amen? We got to go up through the ranks, down through the ranks. We got to have people with high impact. So we're going to pray about the title today, and we're going to ask you, dear Lord, please help those of us who desire it to have more wisdom and eternal impact in the world in which we live. Jesus, I thank you. Uh, just a week ago, we talked about how you, Jesus, have become for us our righteousness. But that same verse in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Lord, tells us that you have become for us our wisdom, our righteousness, and our redemption. We thank you that you have imputed or put your righteousness on us that we might be right with God. But Lord, I want to thank you also today that you have become for us our wisdom. There is never an excuse, Lord, for any Christian to say, I can't have wisdom because Jesus, you are, you are our wisdom. We thank you this morning for that. And we pray that for people who feel defeated in that area, who feel that they don't have enough wisdom or enough eternal impact, that you would bolster them this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit and change them through your word. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, here we go. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. Okay? Now, when we look at this, the first three words that stuck out to me when I read this verse were these, God gave them. Was anybody blessed last week to learn what imputed righteousness is? We were driving home and Bria said, I like the way you put that about the word inside imputed is just put God. You know, I, and this is a true statement in all my studying for that. And in all my understanding of the word imputed, I never thought of that till I was standing in front of you saying the sentence. God, it's like God gave it to me, you know, and I want you to understand something. You may say, uh, I don't have a great education. I'm not that smart. I'm not whatever. There's no excuse. God wants to give every Christian wisdom. And wisdom is not equal to your IQ. Let's just get that out of the way. Wisdom has nothing to do with your IQ. You can be mentally handicapped and have wisdom. Christ has become our wisdom, our righteousness, and redemption. Wisdom is not an accumulation of facts. Wisdom is, an, is a godly application of God's ways to living. Amen? Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Now, first of all, God gave them all these things, and that's critical. James 1.17, if you're doubting what God can give you, I want you to pray about this verse this week. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from where? It's from above. It's Christmas time. Parents, grandparents, every good and perfect gift is not from Amazon. Right? It's from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He gives every good gift. So God gave them these things. What did he give these boys? He gave them learning. He gave them skill, and he gave them understanding. Those are some pretty heavy words. That's some pretty big stuff. Now, to instruct you in gaining wisdom, which is the godly, it's the application of godly knowledge toward everyday living, okay? Wisdom. The first thing you need to do is ask for it. 
Now, you could have called me a nerd or a geek when I was young, trying to like read the whole dictionary cover to cover, or like buying commentaries by Charles Spurgeon when I was in middle school, you know, but my, I was always craving, I, God gave it to me, I was always craving wisdom. Do you know God will honor you every time you want wisdom? He's never going to say no to that. You have to ask for it, right? Just ask for it. James chapter 1, verse 5. What does the Bible say? You might be sitting there saying, well, I lack wisdom, Shelley. I, I don't have a whole bunch. If any of you lacks wisdom, what are you supposed to do? Ask God. God's not sitting up there saying, oh, you want wisdom? Here, I'll dribble a little bit down to you. I, I, you, you really want it? Ask me again. Do you really want it? No. What does God say? If you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives what? generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. God's not going to say, well, you never asked for wisdom before. And now you're like 96 years old and you want wisdom. Yeah, right. No, that's not what God says. Oh, you want wisdom? My goodness, you're only five years old. I've seen five-year-olds crave wisdom. Amen. And he's not going to find fault with you. He's not going to say, well, it's too late or you did this or that. I'm going to take the Bible at its word. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He's going to give generously and without finding fault. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person, the person who doubts, should not think he will receive anything from God because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. All right. So when we ask for wisdom, we need to ask and not doubt that God will give it to us. Anybody feeling a faith rising up in you that says, hey, I can ask God for wisdom. I can become a much wiser person. Yes, you can. We're going to ask God for that. Wisdom. Wisdom in the Greek comes from the word Sophia. Anybody ever seen the AI humanoid named Sophia? Have you ever seen a video about Sophia? You can look that up on Google, okay? They named this humanoid Sophia that is a result of AI. She looks real, like a real person. Sophia, because that is the Greek word behind the word wisdom. So in the Greek in your Bible, it's Sophia. Now, this is interesting because the Greek root philo, like as in Philadelphia means love. Sophia means wisdom. So philosophy is a word that is rooted in love of wisdom. Okay, Sophia is the root wisdom. But in the Bible, okay, according to the Bible, as this word is used, here is all the things that wisdom means when it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Okay, so tell me if any of these are things you want. It means broad and full intelligence, used of the knowledge of very diverse matters. How many of you, know, how many of you think to yourself, say, yeah, God gave me wisdom for what he knew I needed to be in life or do in life, right? God did not give me wisdom for cooking, okay? I don't have any, I don't have any broad and full intelligence on cooking, but he gave me wisdom for mathematics. He gave me wisdom for the art of teaching. Amen. Some of you, he's given wisdom for farming. Some of you, he's given wisdom for um, being a doctor. He gives us wisdom for all kinds of things that we need. So this includes every kind of intelligence you would need to be the person God wants you to be. Amen. So no more excuses. Well, I can't do that, God, because I don't have enough wisdom for that. He will give it to you. It includes science and learning. Who's thankful that there are many Christians that God has gifted in science and learning? Amen? All right? It includes interpreting dreams and giving sage advice. How many of you would like to be able to give better advice to people? I was blessed. I had a young lady call me up yesterday, say to me, you give the best advice on relationships. You help me understand how to have relationships. How many of you know that Christians can give the best advice on relationships, right? Ask for it. It's part of wisdom. 
It means the skill in the management of affairs, managing all the affairs of life. Sometimes life can seem overwhelming. God can give you wisdom for that. It means devout and proper prudence in your intercourse with men who are not disciples of Christ. How many of you like more wisdom in talking to and walking with people who don't know Jesus? Right? There's a wisdom that is involved there. Skill and discretion in imparting Christian truth. Who would like to be able to be more articulate about the Christian truth? That's part of wisdom. God will give it to you. It also includes knowledge and practice of the requisites for godly and upright living. Who has ever known a person that called themselves a Christian and you're like, yikes, they're a Christian? They don't even know how to live their life right. Have you ever had that happen? That is somebody who lacks Wisdom. Need to be able to apply facts. Wisdom is the application of knowledge in a godly manner to the glory of God. Now, Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You're not going to have wisdom unless you fear the Lord. And you must ask for it. But it's very, it's an all-inclusive word. So the Bible says they had learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. They had understanding in all visions and dreams. Number one, you've got to ask for wisdom. Number two, you've got to do your best. Okay, you have to, do, if God gives you something, you've got to do your best with it. Listen, God is not going to take you to the next level until you prove that you're going to do the best with the level he's given you. That should be an amen. Technical department's given me a slight head nod. I, I know people don't like to hear this, but God gave them wisdom, but in order for them to learn and gain skill, what did they have to do? They had to apply it and do their best at it. Now, as Christians, we got to do our best. There's just something that I, I want to share with you guys. It's just a, it's a down-to-earth example, okay? When I first became a teacher in Christian school, I became uh, the middle and high school math and Bible teacher in a Christian school. You know, fresh out of college, first teaching job. And man, I'm telling you, I did everything in that classroom that I could do for the glory of God. I mean, I gave it everything I had. How many of you are not doubting that when I did it, I gave it everything I had? Okay? Because that is the attribute of a person who wants to honor God. You've got to do your best. I'm going to come back to that story in a minute. James 2.26, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, right? If your spirit isn't alive, your body is not going to be alive. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Yes, you must have faith, but that faith must be followed by the works that will accompany true faith. Here's one of my favorite scriptures, and I know it's one of Connie's favorite scriptures. This is so much one of my favorite scriptures. I tried to find a piece of this paper, but I couldn't. When I had my students do their math homework, I printed out a piece of paper with grids that they could do every problem in, you know. There was 15 grids on the front, 15 on the back, and at the bottom of the front and back of the math homework paper, I typed this verse on every person's math homework. And, and the kids at first were like, and then by the end of the year, they got it, they understood. I said, listen, I'm not joking with you, and I'm not using this as a way to try to entice you to do your homework. What I'm telling you is if you claim to belong to Jesus Christ, you will care as much about the math problems that you do at night for homework as anything else. You will do your absolute best. Amen? Now listen, whatever you do, work at it as for the Lord and not for people. Yes, you may be doing it for people, but you're really doing it for... God, for because the Lord, look at this, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. 
Now, there have been many people watching this broadcast online uh, who could testify to this and tell you. I have spoken to retreats of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and I have spoken at places where literally there might be five people sitting in the room. It doesn't change the way that I preach God's word. Amen? Because I'm not doing it for the people in the room. I mean, I am by default, but I'm doing it for God. So I better give up my best. Listen, I think you know this. And I'm not, I'm saying this just to give you a testimony of how this works in real life. These sermons come as a result of me sitting in my home office or in my, at my kitchen table watching my birds out the window, but sitting there with my computer, about five different versions of the Bible, about 10 different commentaries spread out everywhere, sometimes having to get up and pace the floor and pray and think and my brain starts to hurt and I'm working and I'm working and I won't stop until I know I have a full handle on that message because I'm not preparing that message for you. I've got to answer to God for it. Amen? So back to the school story. It was the same thing in a classroom. Whether I had a class of five kids, a class of 25 kids, when I was nothing more than a rookie teacher, I gave it everything I had. And in every school I went to, I never once asked for this. Every school I went to, they would come to me and say, hey, would you consider being the principal of the school? You know why? Because I was being the best teacher that I could be. And what you want a leader, what you want a true Christian to be, is somebody who's the best that they can be in their circumstances. I thought of something else this morning as I was getting ready. Let's bring it down to even a less glorified level here. When I worked in the as as an insurance agency secretary before I got my teaching job, Came out of college, didn't get a teaching job right away. And I worked as an insurance agency secretary, okay, in a very secular environment. I was thinking about this the other day. It could bring tears to my eyes. I was a Christian wanting to serve the Lord, and yet day after day I was sitting there, and I was like preparing uh, index card, what they're called leads for the insurance agents to take out and try to knock on doors and visit people and sell insurance. Oh, my God, why am I spending days doing this? Is this what my life is going to be? But the Lord said, you're here. Do it right. And I would sit there at my desk, and I learned, I memorized so many zip codes in those years. I mean, all I would do is I'd deal in leads, and, and, I, would, and I would check insurance applications and write the envelopes to send the applications to the home office. And I mean, I remember this distinctly. I would sit there with my pen and write as neatly and as carefully as I could everything that I put in the mail, even the addresses. I made sure I did it to the best of my ability. Address after address after zip code, thinking, what? I was sitting in my house this past week, and I was writing thank you cards to donors. And I was addressing cards to Canada and Texas and South Carolina and California and Montana, right? Little old me sitting in Irwin, Pennsylvania. And as it struck me, as I'm, I'm sitting there myself, you know, writing the thank you cards to our donors, carefully writing out each address, the Lord struck me with that thought. One day you were preparing insurance leads for agents to sell insurance. Today, You're writing thank you cards to donors from around the world who are responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're doing it the exact same way. Amen? Whatever you do, you got to do it to the best of your ability. This is what God honors. 
I know it's, it's kind of a hard thing to hear, but it's the truth, right? Now, in the New Living Translation, it says it this way. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of dreams. Warren Wearsby, fervent prayer can never replace faithful study. Both are necessary. This is the one thing that hope and passion hears about all the time. I love it. You cannot just say, Lord, give me wisdom. God, I want to know the Bible and just pray that all day long and never pull out your Bible. And I want to say this. Yes, I have daily devotionals that people love and I believe in daily devotionals. I read Oswald Chambers, Charles Spurgeon. I love daily devotionals. I want to make one thing clear. You are never going to be for God what you're supposed to be by reading somebody else's devotion every day and saying, I got the word of God in me today. It's not enough. You got to take out your own Bible and learn to wrestle with it yourself. If what you're getting about God is just coming from me or another preacher or a book you're reading, it's never going to be what it should be. You got to get this book out and you've got to spend time learning the word of God, reading it in some methodical fashion, saying, God, I'll take just this one chapter and all month long, I'm going to read it. I'm going to refer to commentaries. I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to try to memorize some of it. I'm going to relate scripture to scripture. Can I get an amen? That's what's missing in churches today. You got to study the word for yourself. J. Vernon McGee, the Holy Spirit is not a help and a crutch for a lazy person. You are going to have to study the word of God. God speaks to us through his written word today. You are going to have to study his word. Preachers and teachers can model to you what studying is like and what the outcome of studying is, but the goal is discipleship. You need to do that, right? These four youths, God gave all four of them learning and skill in literature and wisdom, but notice a difference here. That's what God gave all four, but Daniel in particular was able to have understanding in all visions and in dreams. And in the book of Daniel, you're going to see him interpret some wild dreams. Amen? Some of the dreams that Daniel interpreted, we're living out today and are still waiting to see the end of their fulfillment. Good, good stuff. It's, it's, as, it's as good. You might even be more excited by these dreams than you were parts of Revelation. Daniel is so prophetic. Now, John Walvoord, although all four youths were skilled in Babylonian learning, and were able to separate the truth from the false, only Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. This was not an incidental remark, but a fact necessary to understand Daniel's role as a prophet in later chapters. In this, Daniel differed from his companions as a prophet. If you watch the Genesis Bible study, we talked about spiritual gifts on Tuesday night and how God freely gives those to different people. Daniel had a gift for prophecy and he had a gift for interpreting dreams. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, not just the Bible. Are you hearing me? He gave them skill in all literature and wisdom. So let's talk about that for a minute. When you go back to Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, we know that Nebuchadnezzar's goal was to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. That's a synonym for Babylonians, right? So his goal was to make them understand the culture in which they lived. Amen? Now, there are some Christians who say, well, if you're a Christian, you should never seek to understand other worldviews or the way the culture lives. Just keep your head in the Bible. I'm not that kind of Christian. Now, let me explain this to you. Warren Wearsby, he said, some sincere believers think that all worldly education is sinful, while others, just as sincere, believe that God's people should understand the mindset of the world but not be controlled by it. This is an issue like women preachers or speaking in other tongues or when does the rapture happen? This is an issue that Christians can debate and divide over without saying you're not a Christian. Amen? Disclaimer, my whole career as a Christian school teacher, I not only taught math, 
and Bible, I taught biblical worldview. One of my favorite courses was a course I taught to all juniors and seniors. And what we did was we spent an equal amount of time. I taught the kids equally in Marxism, Leninism, atheism. I taught them equally about the New Age movement as I did Christianity in that final course for juniors and seniors. Because by the time you have enough education, you should be able to discern truth from error. Amen? Once you've got enough truth, you learn to put it through the grid of truth, and you can weigh and see how ridiculous other worldviews are. That's not the first thing you do, but it's something you should end up being able to do. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and the Apostle Paul read the classics and even quoted from them in his letters. Have you ever seen that in the book of Acts and throughout the Bible? Paul would actually quote secular uh, philosophers of his day. Why did he do that? Because he wanted the people who were interested in that secular philosophy to learn to compare and contrast that to what God had to offer. Then they'd step back and say, whoa, right? So Warren Wisby said, by understanding the mindset of the Babylonian people, especially the kings, magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, which, by the way, are all good or bad things, bad, Daniel and his three friends were better able to show them the superiority of God's wisdom. Now, let me back it up and say, when I taught this to middle and high school students and to adults, by the way, I did many adult biblical worldview classes, the first thing I would do is ground the young people in the truth of God, the attributes of God, right? The core things about the Lord. By the time they were juniors and seniors, listen, just about a year ago, I had one of the ladies, she's a mom now, reach out to me that I taught like 20 years ago. And she thanked me for that class. She said, still to this day, and even more so now, I can interpret what is new age spirituality because of what you taught us. You taught us to see it through the grid of God. Amen? So we should not be scared by these things if we're well grounded in the word. I never tell a baby Christian Somebody who doesn't have a good, solid handle on the word of God, never tell them to go down those roads. But when you are a mature Christian, you better go down that road so that you can explain to people what is wrong with what they believe. This guy, Robert Murray McShane, he lived in the 1800s. This is what he said. True, we ought to know the classics. I love this. But we should only study the secular classics as chemists handle poison, to discover their qualities, not to infect their blood with them. Okay? For example, there was one class, a particular mature class that I had, and I decided to go buy a copy of the Quran and to read parts of the Quran and to sit in class with them and have them read sections and compare it to the biblical truth that we know. I would not do that with every class. And I will only read so much of that stuff. Because God's got to be primary. But listen, we can't put our heads in the sand. If we put our heads in the sand and know nothing of what other people believe, how are we ever going to truly reach them on the territory that they're at, the ground that they walk, okay? At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in, and they actually had to stand before Nebuchadnezzar himself. So this is a big deal. Like, he is the king. John Walvert, the four young captives, three-year period of preparation ends here. So they've been going through this for three years, and they had a personal interview before Nebuchadnezzar. At this time, apparently all of the young men in training were tested by the king. And I wrote down in my notes, these young men now must trust for the time of testing the same God on whom they had relied through all the preparation process. Hallelujah. God brings you to a place of testing, maybe a testing of your faith. Could be a testing of many different areas in life. But you want to do everything you do to the glory of God 
Because one day, everything you do is going to culminate in a grand test. And you want to be able to trust the same God in the time of the test that you did every step along the way. Hallelujah. That's a great philosophy to live by. And I've told you, I live by that in terms of seeing Christ. I've said this before. It bears repeating. I often pray to the Lord, Lord, help me to walk with you in such a way that when you call me away through rapture or death, I don't even miss a beat. Because some people, even Christians, are like, I'm trying my best to live for the Lord, I'm trying my best to live for the Lord. I think I'm living for the Lord, but oh, if I die or if the rapture happens, am I right? Lord, help me to live in such a way that I am so in tune with you and depending on you that when death comes or the rapture comes, I just step right into it because it's you. Amen? Times of testing. You have to be trusting the same God you trusted through all the preparation process. So when the king had commanded that they be brought in, Warren Wearsby, we don't know how many students went through the entire course of study, but it's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar himself took the time to examine them. Since the new graduates were to become his personal advisors, the king wanted to be sure that he was getting the best. Let's just shift this into a different paradigm. Evil, secular King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be sure that he was getting the best as his servants. What do you think King Jesus desires? Amen? I want to be the best that I can be for King Jesus. Amen? There is, that is a good motivation for us to have. Because one day, they stood before Nebuchadnezzar, one day we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. As we shall see later, the addition and the promotion of these four Jewish boys... You're going to see this throughout Daniel. It created jealousy and resentment among the advisors to the point that they actually tried to get rid of Daniel. Remember that? Catch him in prayer, throw him in the lion's den. Watch this because this is going to apply to you. When you go after Jesus with all your heart, other people are going to rise up out of jealousy, envy, whatever it might be, and they might even try to destroy you. But who is your defender? God's your defender. Watch this. As older men, okay, the other advisors, they resented the youth of these boys. As Babylonians, they resented their Jewish race. As experienced servants, they envied their great ability and their knowledge. How many of you know that people can get jealous when you start going after God the way you're supposed to go after God? And sometimes people are going to come after you. But you got to remember, I teach people this all the time. Your concern, yes, biblically, you need to be concerned with how people feel about you to the best that you can live at peace with all men. But your main concern is not what people think about you. Your concern is what God knows about you. And if what God knows about you is right, what people think about you will eventually come into alignment. Now, sometimes it takes time. You know, I've had many people come against me in my day because of who I am, what I do. And I just kind of, Okay, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm not going to defend myself. God, you're my defender. And it always evens itself out, right? This happened to these four young men. They were attacked for this. But when all was said and done, God got his way and they stood before the king. Now that phrase, they stood before the king, doesn't just mean they stood there waiting to be tested. That has a deeper meaning. It's another way of saying that they entered the king's personal service. They become number one to the king as far as his advisor, his close people. 
Uh, the Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary said they were advanced to a position of favor near the throne. Because none was found like them, they stood before the king in a place of great influence. Amen? And why was none found like them? Because they gave their best for the Lord. Okay, so let's carry this out in our own life. If I give my best for the Lord in everything, in how I do my dishes, in how I speak to my neighbors, in how I study the word of God, in how I interact with people, in how I work my employment, if I do my best in everything knowing I'm doing it for God and not for people, and if I ask the Lord to give me wisdom, and I study his word as I should, and I commit to his word as I should, God is going to make me to be the cream of the crop for his sake. Amen? And I will stand in a place of influence. Now, your place of influence may be to influence your family. It may be the place of influence you may have is your prayer closet. You become this prayer warrior like nobody's business. Your place of influence may be uh, at your at your job, your place of influence may be in a particular relationship. Your place of influence may be in your church. It may be, it, it could be anywhere. It doesn't mean that it's big or small. It just means you will influence prominently wherever you're at. Amen? That is what we're aiming to be. We're aiming to be like these four men. Proverbs 22, 29. Okay, Daniel and his friends are seeing a fulfillment of this. The Bible says, as a general principle, Proverbs are general principles, says, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Isn't that a general rule in life? When somebody really applies themselves, what happens? They become influential. Now, that can happen... When a person is really skillful at wickedness, they become very wickedly influential. Amen? But when we who are committed to Christ become dedicated to our godliness, we become a godly influence, a force to be reckoned with. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. Talk about this for a minute. First of all, 10 times better is incredible. It's not just they were twice as good. They were 10 times better. But these other characters, these magicians, these enchanters, they excelled above their secular counterparts. Now, let's talk about these guys, because we're going to encounter them throughout the book of Daniel. And, and not everybody may have your... Uh, a full understanding of what this meant when they were magicians, enchanters. Magicians were people who dealt in the occult. So other spiritual powers other than the one true God, right? Anytime you're messing around with spiritual powers other than the one true God, you are dealing in the occult, you are dealing in wickedness, and you are opening yourself up to give the devil a foothold in your life. Amen? Amen? So when you fool around with crystal balls, when you read Deepak Chopra or Oprah Winfrey, okay, all these people who are into New Age, it's not harmless. I've taught that stuff, believe me. New Age is dangerous. The occult is dangerous. You can't fool around with that stuff. I'm going to get to it in a minute where the Bible says this. Sorcerers. Specifically, were people who specialized in casting spells. How many of you know there's still people in the world that cast spells on others? Witchcraft, casting of spells. It's happening around the world, America. Astrologers, when you read that in Daniel, these are people who studied movements of the stars and their influence on events. Wickedness. Wickedness. I don't want to know what your sign is. I don't care what your sign is. Don't read your horoscope. It is wickedness. The devil works through that. You hearing me? You know, you know. Either the technical part is tired, or people aren't hearting that one. 
diviners. These are people who sought to see the future by various methods. Crystal ball, medium, palm reader, whatever. Don't fool around with it. Ouija boards. Like, these are not things to fool around with. Are you with me? They are dangerous. They are portals to the devil. Because if it's spiritual and it isn't Jesus Christ, it is dangerous. Deuteronomy 18.9. Listen to what God said way back to the Israelites. Okay, so, so imagine, here's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are Israelites in Babylon, and this is what Babylon consists of. All of these people who deal in this stuff. But here's what God told the Israelites, and here's what God says to us. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. You say, oh, well, we don't do that anymore. I mean, in America, we're not burning. Well, some wicked people are killing their kids in various ways. But what about the mass promotion of abortion? Right? Wickedness. There shall be not found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens. Okay? All astrology's out. All crystal balls are out. All mediums. I mean, I drive down Route 30. There's a big billboard advertising mediums. I mean, people are really into this stuff. Or a necromancer or anyone who inquires of the dead. Let's stop right here for a second. Get on the website and you can somehow find the link to a message I did called No Ghost But the Holy Ghost. I see this on Facebook all the time among Christians, and so I'm just going to deal with it again straight out. You are not hearing from your dead loved one. You can hate me. It's okay. Your dead loved ones... And, and the Satan preys upon our weakness and our natural desire to, we should be thinking about our loved ones, right? And we miss our departed loved ones. But Satan preys upon a natural desire. I see Christians talking about a creak in their house or something that appears at the top of their steps or what their cat does or what the bird outside is doing and that's aunt so-and-so or that's grandma or that's somebody coming back to tell me blah, 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 blah. Lies. That's all lies. When you die, you go into the power of God, either in his presence or separated from him. And the Bible is 100% clear on this. People do not come back and talk to the living. But do you know who does? Demons. Demons love to pose as departed loved ones. Why? Because that's an easy inroad. You love your departed loved one. You want to hear from your departed loved one. Demons come in and pose as ghosts. There's no such thing as a ghost. There's demons. That's it. I know that's a tough one, but it has to be said. Don't fool around with that. Don't entertain that thought. Put it out of your head. Go back to the word of God. Nobody, don't fool around with charmers, mediums, necromancers, or one who inquires of the dead. Somebody who fools around with the dead. Necromancy. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. In other words, that's the reason God said, when I take you into the land, you've got to get rid of them all. Because if you don't get rid of them all, they're going to infiltrate you. And not only are they going to die eternally, but you're going to die eternally. Amen? Okay, glad that's done.
Oh, it's not. Okay, well, keep continuing on. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations, which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Believe me, everything you need to know about departed loved ones and every bit of hope that you need to have for being again with those who loved Christ and you loved is in this book. That's it. Every bit of information you need about your future is in this book. Can I get an amen? It is God's grace that he doesn't give us details about the future. How many of you are thankful that 40 years ago you didn't know what you were going to have to go through? God gives grace for the moment. He gives bread for the day. Amen? Don't fool around with that stuff. Everything you know about the security of your future, you need to know is right in this book. Don't fear from this book. Don't fool around with spiritual powers in any way, shape, or form. Whether you think it's kids stuff, whether it's printed every day in the paper, whether other Christians are talking about it, get away from it and stand boldly. Amen? And when a house is haunted, it's only haunted by demons. I believe stuff is real. I believe weird things go on. I know they do. But it ain't Aunt Martha. It's a demon. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. What a statement. He made it through all this. This is crazy. Daniel lived to see Cyrus, the Persian leader, conquer Babylon, October of 539 B.C. Some 66 years after Daniel had been taken captive. Can you imagine that? They're captive 70 years, and they stay faithful to God. Oh, my goodness, I just thought of something. The Bible says that the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, right? On average. 70 years they were captive in a foreign land. 70 years. We're just about guaranteed at least 70 years to be stuck in this foreign land we live in. Oh, we'll be going home. Isn't that cool? I never thought of that before. That's cool. By this point, Daniel was probably over 80 years old, and he'd lived a godly life in the public eye for almost 70 of those years. He had outlasted some of the most powerful kings that the world has ever seen. And for all the miraculous works God performed through and for Daniel, it's important to note that he never delivered Daniel from Babylon. Do you hear that? Never delivered Daniel from Babylon. Daniel lived nearly his entire life as an exile in foreign land, as a hostage in a culture that was hostile to his faith. And he was 100% faithful, 100% successful, and we are still relishing in the word of God about his life. Do you want to be that kind of saint? Faithful in exile? The message of Daniel then is not that God will remove all forms of oppression in our lives. Instead, this account serves as a promise from God that his people can find success and remain faithful to him even in the most trying of circumstances. John Walvoord, the narrative as it stands is beautifully complete. An eloquent testimony to the power and grace of God in a dark hour of Israel's history. When the faithfulness of Daniel and his companion shines all the brighter because it occurs in the context of Israel's captivity and apostasy. I want you to know something this morning. We are in the worst time that the world and America has ever faced as far as the apostasy from the faith, spiritual deception, and the captivity of the false church. We are the worst that we have ever seen. That is why God's true servants are shining even brighter. That's why people are still turning to Jesus and people are still growing in him. Amen? Because you can be faithful 
and you can shine. Certainly Daniel would not have been recognized as a prophet of God and a channel of divine revelation if he had not been a man of prayer an uncompromising moral character whom God could honor fittingly. Daniel and his companions represent the godly remnant of Israel that preserved the testimony of God even in dark hours of apostasy and divine judgment. Will you be a woman of prayer? Will you be a man of uncompromising moral character? In every age... God is looking for those whom he can use. And this is my last quote, and I'm going to put a little picture up after it, and then we're going to pray and sing. Listen to this. Each believer is either a conformer, you either conform, or you are a transformer. We're either being squeezed into the world's mold, or we're transforming things in the world into which God has put us. Transformers don't always have an easy life, but it's an exciting one. And it gives us great delight to know that God is using us to influence others, doesn't it? You're either a conformer or a transformer. You're, there's no neutral ground. Have I told you that before? You're either with the devil or you're with Christ. You're either a conformer or a transformer. Now, I don't know the ages of everyone who's in here, but does anybody remember the toy that transformers? My brothers had them. Oh, they were so cool. Remember these guys? Transformers, more than meets the eye. Remember that? How many remember the commercial? I know, you finally got me to sing. Because my brothers had these things everywhere. They collected Transformers. I'm out there with my Legos. All right. Transformers, let me sing it for you. It says it right there. Transformers, more than meets the eye. Okay, why do I sing that? Why were these things more than meets the eye? Transformers, like this guy, this was Optimus Prime. He was like the most popular. And he would transform from a semi-truck into a robot. Like, I don't know, a robot with a gun, a killer robot. I don't know what these things did. They protected people, I guess. But he could sneak in because you thought he was just a semi-truck, didn't you? But you picked him up off the living room floor, that semi-truck, and you knew what to do with him. And now he's a robot with a gun. Defending people, right? Optimus Prime. He was more than meets the eye. Now, he was a transformer. Listen, do you want to be a transformer? Do you want to be more than meets the eye? People may be looking at you and you're just sitting out at a restaurant somewhere and they think, oh, that's just an average person. And then they strike up a conversation with you or you offer to pray with them and all of a sudden they're like, this is more than meets the eye. We're going to open next week with a chorus. Transformers. <laughs> okay, That should have been the ending song. What was I thinking? Okay, anyway. We want to be more than meets the eye. We want to live for what is eternal. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray about that. You want to transform your world. You want to be powerful for Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. I believe that it has sunk deeply. Let us take your word for exactly what it says. Help it to just dig into our hearts and settle there. God, if anyone needs to call upon you as Savior, for the forgiveness of sin and new life in God. Please let them do that. Let your people rise up and become, truly, Lord, more than meets the eye. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. We are going to sing a song to end here, Ancient Words by Michael W. Smith. I think it's appropriate. Daniel's an old book, but how many of you know those ancient words are exactly what we need?